Well, remember this, only God's word prepares us for Satan's attack. You don't even have to turn there because you know this verse by heart. Man shall not live by what? Bread alone. But by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When did Jesus say that? The context is everything. Jesus is facing the devil 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten, he's weakened, he is under constant assault. And yet he says, my way of defeating the devil is not using the power of the Godhead, but to use the same sword of the spirit that every believer has. You see, the only God's word prepares us for Satan's attack. And when Jesus met and defeated Satan, he did it only by quoting verses that we all should know. Well, if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter four real quickly, uh, this, this uh, it's just across the page in my Bible. Look at what it says in the first two verses of 1 Timothy four. It, it's the rising tide of evil in the empire of darkness. Now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, the closer we get to Christ's return, the closer we get to his prophetic promises, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with hot irons. And then turn to 2 Timothy chapter three, the next book over, look at the first five verses. Paul continues to identify these end times. And, and he said, this is Satan's plans for the last days to neutralize the church in the most vital time to be a light for the Lord. He says, but know this, 2 Timothy 3, 1, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That word perilous is stressful. We live in the most stressful time. People live under constant stress of everything, whether it's financial or work stress or, or terrorist stress or, or health stress. We just know too much. It's perilous times. But look what characterizes the world at the end. Verse two, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They're willing to abandon family, home, marriage, church, anything for money. Boasters kind of characterizes our social media. It's the in your face, let me broadcast everything world. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving devilish tongues, that's what slanders mean. Those who surrender their tongues to slander and malign like the devil, the accuser, without self-control, brutal, despising good. Doesn't that characterize where our culture is? Despising good, making fun of good. Lovers, uh, excuse me, um, Ed Strong, haughty, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. There we go, verse four. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now look at verse five. The result, having a form of godliness. They go through the motions. They go to church. They look godly. But denying its power, from such people turn away. Wow. Paul continues. Look at the, the very next chapter, chapter four. He says that wordless living leads to world-like living. I charge you, verse one, chapter four, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, verse three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Yeah, I just came from a weekend with all these people in the ministry. In fact, it's not uncommon to hear this. They say people just don't want to be taught from the word of God. They want to be entertained. They want a short sermonette for a Christianette who is on their way to something else and there is no attention to the word of God. Did you know most churches... When men are coming in, I've talked to them from, from the seminaries and the places where the Bible institutes where I teach, they say, when these trained students of the word of God go out, they're told now 20 minutes, 15, 20, 25, that's most that people can endure. That's all that they'll tolerate. Look, look at where that comes from. Verse three, for the time will come when they will not endure 
healthy doctrine, sound doctrine, were there. And what's happening is the church is just eroding and, and accommodating to it. And, and the, the entertainment part of the service dominates, but the teaching part of the service doesn't. You know, one of the saddest things I've ever heard, someone told me this week, they said, did you know, there, there are a whole group of people at Calvary that have said, we'll not sit through another Revelation sermon. So as soon as the music's over, they leave. Why? Because they will not endure sound teaching. They said, I'm not gonna hear it anymore. That's amazing. What does it say? But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they heap up for themselves teachers and they turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. So that's why Revelation 9 is so important. Because, and just turn there with me, at least we have to get there because it's time for communion. But when you turn to chapter 9, you're turning to a chapter of the Bible that unmasks what Satan's doing, his plans, and the power that he wields as the God of this world. And in obedience to God's desire that we read and hear and keep these doctrines in Revelation, it has to be that we study it. In fact, Revelation 1-3, the book opens saying that God specifically gave the truth of Revelation to Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ to give to his church and for his church to read and listen and heed. So what does chapter nine say? It says the whole world is offered a choice. Christ offers endless life and the devil and his demons and the destroyer that is right now enslaved in the abyss, held in confinement, offers endless death. And the bottomless pit gives us lessons from God about the activity, the way that Satan neutralizes deadens, divides, and basically renders believers powerless in this world. 